Antarctica is the coldest, highest, driest, windiest continent in the world. It's a vast desert with lots and lots of water, but it's all locked away as ice. But even with its isolation, Antarctica has still been affected by human-induced climate change. The ozone hole still appears over Antarctica every September, as it has done since the 1970s, and will continue to do until about 2060. And this increases ultraviolet radiation over Antarctica each spring. But the ozone hole has also changed other aspects of the climate for the whole southern hemisphere. It's brought the westerly wind belt further south, and that's meant that the Antarctic Peninsula, this bit here that's sticking up, has become one of the most rapidly warming places on the planet. But that tightening belt also acts to isolate most of the continent of Antarctica from the worst effects of climate change. So it's made it stay cool in the main, but the warmer oceans are still creeping in underneath, getting under those ice sheets and melting them from below. So what's a typical summer like in Antarctica? It's only a few months long, and in the summer, it's 24 hours sunlight. The temperatures, though, are still pretty cold. On the coast, it'll be as cold as your freezer at home, minus 20 degrees Celsius in the nighttime, and in the daytime, it might get up a little bit warmer than your fridge at home, maybe about plus 10 degrees Celsius, so still pretty chilly. In the winter, it's even colder, and it's continuously dark. So they're pretty challenging conditions. And in addition to that, as I said before, we've got the ozone hole, which has increased the ultraviolet radiation over, the Antarctica, uh, over Antarctica each spring. So who lives there? When we think of Antarctica, we think of these cute, iconic penguins, seals. But they're just summer visitors. The emperor penguins stay for the winter, but the true Antarcticans are the mosses and the lichens that I work on. These plants are able to survive underneath the snow in winter and emerge at the end of winter and, and rehydrate, and de but even through the summer, they still have to freeze and thaw and desiccate and rehydrate. So they're pretty challenging conditions. And it's not just plants. There are animals, but they're very, very tiny. So this is a tardigrade or a water bear, and it's on a moss leaf for scale. Okay, so imagine a moss leaf, really, really tiny. Those animals and plants are really, really tough. They're the real Antarcticans. They can survive and freeze and thaw and desiccate and rehydrate all through the summer and into the winter. So the key thing is that they can survive frozen and um, for months on end, sometimes for years. Some of these plants have survived un in Antarctica during the times when it's been glaciated, where the ice has covered the whole continent. So they've been frozen and they've come out from those conditions and they're able to live again each summer when conditions get good. So in order to do this, I've talked about freezing and thawing. They must be able to freeze and desiccate and rehydrate and come back to life. So how do they do that? Now, if you imagine a, tr a lettuce or a, or a tree, they have plumbing. And if you put plumbing in cold conditions, it freezes, and that's the end of that. So you don't get trees or lettuce in Antarctica. What you do get are these plants and animals that can freeze and then come back to life afterwards. And if you don't believe me about this, try when you go home, take some moss and some lettuce and put both in your freezer. And when you take the lettuce out, it'll look a lot worse than the moss does. So in my research group, we've been looking at... What, the, what allows these plants to survive these harsh conditions. So we found that they can produce special sunscreen compounds, shown here on, in yellow on the walls. And this allows them to cope with those harsh UVB, all that radiation that comes through the ozone hole every spring. And these compounds are also great antioxidants, so that gives the moss an edge when it's, um, when it's coping with that freezing and thawing each summer, all through the summer months. They can also produce antifreeze compounds, like sugars and alcohol, and that means they can freeze and thaw and rehydrate and dehydrate. And so all these compounds allow them to survive in those really tough conditions. But these plants are also really old, and they grow really slowly. So this is a moss shoot, and this is 400 years. And 
The way we know that they're old is because mosses lay down this chemical signature along their shoots as they grow. And the chemical signature is an, is an isotope of carbon, a special carbon molecule. And the one that we're looking at is a radioactive signal. And if we take, um, if we look at in the atmosphere, there's carbon dioxide, plants take that up for photosynthesis, they put it into sugars, they lay it down in those cell walls, and then it becomes like tree rings, but on a really tiny scale. And the good thing about mosses is they don't have that plumbing system, so they can't move any of that carbon around, it stays exactly where it was formed, and then the next year, another layer of carbon gets laid down on top. So we can trace this radiocarbon down the chute and see exactly what year that moss was growing in. And if we start off in the current day, here's 2005, sorry. If we go backwards, we see this big peak in radioactivity. And that's when we did this experiment and we released a whole load of nuclear bombs into the atmosphere and we increased the radioactivity. And that was about 50 years ago, in the 1950s and the 1960s. All the plants in the world were taking up that carbon. And if we look in our moss shoots and we can see that radiocarbon peak, that bomb, it's called the bomb peak for obvious reasons, if we can see that peak, we know that piece of moss is more than 50 years old. And this one's even older, so we can keep going backwards, and this one was, uh, is around 500 years. The mosses we've dated are, av are uh, between 100 and 500 years old but they grow really, really slowly. They're only this big, and so their average growth rates are about one millimetre a year. And in addition to telling us how old they are, they have these other chemical signatures that tell us how wet or dry it was in the, um, in the conditions when they were growing. And so we can look at the mosses now and we can say that they're under more dry conditions, drier conditions, than they were 100 years ago. So that tells us that these environments are drying. These Antarctic plants are proxies for climate change. They're telling us that the Antarctic climate is changing over time. And they're, and they're like these coastal ice cores because they're around the coast. They're telling us what's happening to the climate in areas where we can't get that information in any other way. So, we can s it does it matter if they're getting um, drier. It does, because there's tougher plants down there, lichens, that can grow over mosses. They can cope with even colder deserts. So if the mosses are too dry, the lichens will grow over the top, and they'll be taking over these, overgrowing these mosses that have been growing slowly and steadily for 500 years. And it's like losing old-growth moss forests, just as they're unlocking their secrets to us. So in order to inform Antarctic managers and tell them how to preserve these moss beds, we have to work out ways of looking at this moss health across um, big areas. And so, we've, at the, um, the Australian Casey Station um, in East Antarctica, we've been developing methodologies <coughs> ranging from simple methodologies on the ground to um, special cameras and sensors on drones, like in this video. And that means that with colleagues in NASA and the University of Tasmania, we fly over the moss beds and we collect these spectral signatures that come are reflected back off the moss. And they tell us what the moss, how healthy the moss is. So it's a health index for moss on a large scale. And so we can see blue areas where the moss is healthy and active and growing. And we can see red areas where it's dry and stressed. And we can see areas where it's so dry that the moss has actually stopped growing. So, Antarctica is a preserve for peace and science. All Antarctic nations have to take responsibility for preserving that biodiversity and preserving um, the, the living resources in the areas where they're operating. We're developing a state, we're, as custodians of a state of the environment indicator, we've been developing these methodologies that can be used not just by us, Australians in Antarctica, to preserve these precious ecosystems, but can also be used by other countries, by other Antarctic nations around the continent to look after their own terrestrial ecosystems. With, a, with colleagues from around the world, we've been developing an Antarctic nearshore and terrestrial observing system, which will help to protect these ecosystems for future generations in as pristine a state as possible. It's time that we all took action on climate change. 
If we do that, then our Antarctic moss beds will still be around to celebrate their thousandth birthday in 500 years. <laughs>